David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Monday, December 21st. Yes, that's right. 21st, 2020. And uh, the mute button now has uh, given up the ghost here. So finally, uh, decided to let us begin broadcasting the show. It always sounds different in here, in my own head, and in Kegro in the Morning World Headquarters, where we give the introduction twice every day. All right. Time to get rolling on another show. It's, uh, let's see, there's the Great Conjunction is happening today, I guess, down at Conjunction Junction. I suppose that's where I would have it. Uh, don't know if it's going to be clear uh, enough for us to see it here tonight, but good luck to everyone who wants to look to, what, the southwest or so uh, for most of us, I assume, except our listeners in Peru, I guess, who, I don't know. I don't know what the conditions will be like for you, uh, but uh, the Close Conjunction from our perspective anyway, of Saturn and Jupiter in the skies today. Uh, and it is said with great excitement that this is, uh, said, this is said to perhaps have been the phenomenon observed back in the day. And I mean, I, the, I guess actually the day uh, of the, uh, the Christmas star would be explained. The Bethlehem, the star of Bethlehem. Everyone always wondered about that. What happened to that star of Bethlehem anyway? And, uh, yeah, maybe have, might have been the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn at the time, which I guess together up in the sky looked to be something like a double planet, uh, I guess imagine increased in brightness. And, uh, well, we'll all have fun trying to search for that thing at like five o'clock before it's really dark. <laughs> Is, is apparently when it's actually, uh, or should be visible above the horizon <clears throat> for most of us here in uh, what we'll call the Kegro in the Morning Listening Area, the United States, I guess. Uh, but uh, it sets pretty quickly, which is too bad, and I don't know where you have to be in order to see it for a longer amount of time, but I somewhere else on the planet. So good luck to the rest of the planet. Uh, they'll enjoy the show. We will watch it. You can watch uh, through a telescope on live streams from around the world, presumably some of those places with better vantage points. So, uh, I don't know, we'll try and scoot out here in the uh, late afternoon, early evening, and uh, find a nice hill to see whether we can get a good look at the horizon and spot the thing. Uh, hopefully it comes through better than the, uh, the comet that was a little bit of a bust, although I did actually finally manage to see that through a telescope too. Uh, that's it for uh, foreign news, off-the-planet news. And uh, we can come a little closer to home in our roundup today. Here we are, Kegro in the Morning radio show, now live, according to Bill, who's not exactly local, but closer than Saturn or, you know, or, or Jupiter or Pluto, for that matter, uh, which is not even a planet anymore. Or do they, do they reinstate Pluto as a planet? I can't remember what they actually did. I think there was a fight about that. But Bill in Portland, not a planet, says uh, the show's live now, and that's good news for me, the the one running it. Kegro X, me, the one running it. David Waldman reminds you that this is the last December 21st of the Trump administration. That's true, too. Unless, of course, 123 Magic Magic, Sidney Powell does something. It was a hell of a weekend for that. But anyway, cheer up, Bucky. Uh, you got one left. And that's good news. We're in week 205 of what uh, we call the uh, the presidential apprentice, the term of Donald Trump, the, the term that we've considered, uh, well, we've awarded to him despite the fact that he was enormously unpopular, even at the time of his first so-called election, but the Electoral College being what it is, yada, yada, here we are. Uh, and by virtue of that award from the Electoral College, he met over the weekend with some of the craziest people in the country. That's one of the powers you have at the presidency. You can summon the craziest people in the country to come to your office and plot a coup, which, uh, let's see, then about 70% of the punditry spent the uh, early part of the weekend debating whether or not you could actually use the word coup to describe what had happened here. Uh, I guess the big development in it is Sidney Powell is back in. Every time they start kicking her out, they pull her back in. She was dismissed offhand from the uh, 
the the official lineup of the Trump team for utter craziness. But of course, that was just a PR move. She, I guess, uh, I guess the first time it was discovered that they were filing lawsuits blaming the thing that they said was election fraud on Hugo Chavez, who, of course, has been dead for many years. Uh, I, I think that did it, and they, they were unhappy with the backlash from that. And then they said, Sidney Powell doesn't work for the Trump administration, doesn't work for the Trump White House, doesn't work for the Trump campaign, nothing to do with us. She's freelancing this whole thing. They never disavowed Lynn Wood for whatever reason. Uh, Rudy Giuliani, I guess, still got to claim he was working on behalf of President Trump as his personal lawyer. Anyway, uh, now that they're desperate and looking to file more lawsuits, Sidney Powell's apparently back in. She's uh, part of this meeting. Giuliani was there. Mike Flynn, the notorious spy that he just pardoned, was there to do the same thing that he was originally pardoned for. So recidivist Mike Flynn was there. Actually, he was a recidivist before he even did his treason for, for Trump. But anyway, uh, all back in and plotting their strategy for stealing the election. Still working on this thing. I don't know like what it's going to take to throw them off the scent, but uh, you know, maybe the passage of time and everybody saying, oh, wow, he's not president, and then they don't pay attention to him. Greg Dworkin is here. He's not president, but I'm ready to pay attention to him nonetheless. Good morning, Greg. How are you? Good morning. Oh, I have to remind you that Sidney Powell is Flynn's lawyer. Uh, so yes, the right. fact that Mike Flynn and Sidney Powell ah. are both at the same meeting talking about the same crazy mm. is not so crazy. Uh, yeah, and I have I guess to say, one true, of the things but... that drives me crazy is the fact that uh, Donald Trump for four years has been the same insane person. Yes. Uh, incapable, incompetent, uh, Orange. Uh, mobbed up, bottom feeder uh, developer that he always was in New York. And uh, uh, still, uh, rural voters voted for him anyway. And yes, uh, that's one of my obsessions for the next working. couple of years, which we're going to talk about on the show a little all bit right. today. But still, you had all of this crazy going on, and suddenly... 30 days, 720 some odd hours before Trump yes. leaves and Biden comes in, uh, newspaper reporters are discovering that Trump's kind of like weird, you know, like yeah. his uh, personality disorder doesn't allow him to give up and, and uh, uh, concede the election, which, by the way, he's not going to do. And uh, even though there was plenty of stories in the paper after the election in November that, you know, it just takes this, and once we get that milestone, it'll end, mm. and then it'll be this, and then we're just waiting for that, and it's going to be Electoral College, and you can watch it like Schoolhouse Rock on, on C-SPAN or, or cable, because everybody covered it, and it'll be after that. And No, it's going to be never, because he's mm. nuts. And he's always been nuts, and the editors of the papers wouldn't let the reporters who knew this talk about this for yeah. the last four years. Yep. And that's what drives me crazy. It's pretty, it's pretty bad. Thank you for letting me rant. That's why sure. I do the show. Now I yeah. feel better. Okay, well, good. I'm glad that it could help you feel better. But it's absolutely true, of course. And uh, even over the weekend, when they were uh, contemplating this, I guess the 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 topper, the cherry on top of the crazy, in addition to all the coup planning, one thing that actually fell through, I, I guess they didn't let him do. Although who knows? Maybe he launches it by Twitter. He was considering uh, Marshall M A R S H A L L yes. Marshall Law. Uh, right. Well, among other things. Uh, right. Martial Law uh, was what Flynn was there to pitch. And Powell uh, is his lawyer. Right. And Powell was also there. Uh, I don't know whether she was pitching it, but Trump was considering um, essentially embedding her in the government after Trump leaves by naming her as a special counsel, which ordinarily, right, you, you know, the presidents yeah, ordinarily to, to, can't just fire them without enormous repercussions. And she was going right. to leave him or he was going to leave her behind to investigate the the quote unquote election fraud, which really brings me back to what your point was about the editors that the New York Times was pointed out to me, uh, you know, reporting on this under the headline of, yeah, uh, Trump sought to make Powell special counsel to uh, to investigate election fraud, which they probably should have said to investigate nothing because there was no election fraud to make up charges about his predecessor and investigate them. That's what she was going to be left behind to do. Uh, he hasn't done it yet. They reported it as if he was talked out of it. But, you know, there's still time to talk to him. And if, depending on who the last person is, uh, we may or may not get this. Special well, you counsel. know, the Washington Post version is a frustrated Trump redoubles efforts to challenge election mm. and, and talks about the fact that Flynn was in the Oval Office to discuss uh, 
the whole idea of, of using the military to rerun the election. Yes, and Flynn's attorney, Sidney Powell, bit. who has promoted outlandishly false claims about this year's election, including a disproved allegation that Venezuelan communists programmed U.S. voting machines to flip votes for Biden, was also at the meeting. And officials inside the White House, which is to say Mark Meadows leaked this, said Chief of Staff Mark Meadows and White House Counsel Pat Cipollone, it could have been Cipollone that linked it, hmm. pushed back strenuously on the idea of martial law, and they spelled martial correctly in the Washington Post. So Two officials serious. who, like others for this story, spoke on the condition of anonymity to discuss private matters and conversations, hmm. said there had been no efforts inside the White House to actually deploy the military, and that the idea was quickly dismissed at the meeting. So there's a lot of things you can read behind the, the scene here or between the lines. Either Meadows or probably Cipollone uh, uh, leaked this because they wanted to make clear that they didn't believe in yeah. martial law. And also the Washington Post wanted to prove they could spell martial law properly. Mm -hmm. But also uh, they want people to understand without getting crazy about it that Trump is nuts and you have to uh, indulge his, uh, you know, uh, uh, revenge fantasies, revenge porn. And you have to do this on a daily basis if you want to stay in the White House. But they all ignore it because it's just talk. And that's a daily thing. It probably happens every two hours. Every time Trump turns on Fox, uh, he gets nuts about this and then uh, uh, channels Lou Dobbs. And then uh, who, who, by the way, has had to disclaim and and uh, and uh, send uh, PSA messages on Fox that all the stuff that he said about the uh, the stratomatic voting his uh, voting machines. Uh, with the minion, et cetera, oh, yes. uh, was was not really true, and it was just his opinion because the lawyers got a hold of it and said, you know what, you can get sued for uh, yeah, you know libel. It looks like they're gonna, and it won't be him, I guess, because he talked his way out of it. But uh, yeah, suits pending possibly against. But uh, but the the point is that this crazy the, talk happens every nuts. hour of every day and has for four years. And yes. to function in the White House, you ignore it and just go ahead and do your own agenda, which is terrible enough. Function. So huh. the enablers here. Uh, are just as bad as they ever were, but the uh, the head of the uh, uh, White House, uh, which is to say uh, Donald Trump, the head of the government, mm. is uh, is crazy. And you know what? Uh, it wasn't just uh, debating whether or not you could use the term coup or order gulp, <laughs> you know, right. uh, as they do in, in Latin America. More importantly, they were debating about whether or not it's reasonable in 2020, after having put children in cages and lost their parents and tried to overturn the election results and talking about martial law, whether it's right and proper to talk about Republicans as being f***ers. Ah, yes, them. And you know who said that? It was uh, 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 Biden's uh, uh, chief, uh, assistant chief of staff, yes. uh, Jen Dillon. Yes. O'Malley? O'Malley Dillon, I think. Uh, O'Malley Dillon? They're, they're giving her both names. Uh, and, and uh, you know, they were outraged. Mark yes. Marco Rubio was outraged, and everybody else was outraged, and they started, it was so bad, it got so bad, they felt like they had to, like, uh, you know, uh, do their uh, hide-behind uh, religion Bible quotes about how bad it was. Yes. You know, and, and the fact of the matter is, uh, when she said that, because it happens to be true. Oh, yes. Okay. There is that. Uh, Three quarters of the reporters covering this said, uh, you know, it's amazing, they said in print or on Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, which is why I'm going to use this on this family show. What? It's amazing uh, how many Republicans are really upset about the fact that uh, Jenna Malley Dillon said, F yeah. you know, because F that. <laughs> because this is really, and, and you know it was like 90 percent of the reporters reporting it said this is fucking crazy because <laughs> like, you know. Because they are. And so, like, why don't we just say it? Uh, I guess we could. We did. And, and again, I'm, I'm scratching my head. I don't even know what I'm going to do about it. guys for four years? Where were you for four years? Uh, right. I don't and, know. And I besides, mean, they decided that not martial law and not overturning the election, but this comment in this particular uh, use of a uh, interesting term as a noun mm -hmm. describing Republicans right. was going to be the big story. Yes. Well, you know, people get the vapors about weird things. That's definitely that's a, the other fun Washington parlor game. It's not fun, but I mean, they, they think so, and they and they do it all the time. And uh, and of course, uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess probably in the reporters' minds, it's about it's not consciously about this, but they'll probably explain it this way and say, well, you know, it 
with a new president, you usher in a new era. And in this new era, this is the sort of thing. Uh, this era, you, one of the downsides of normalcy is we all catch the vapors about things when people use profanity from high people positions. People using profanity, but, but yeah. at the same time, uh, these guys not only were uh, putting children in cages yes. and separating them from their parents and losing the parents and losing the kids, well, you know, uh, but they're still trying to do it right until the last yes. minute. Right? Uh, and there too. So, so these guys are aptly described by uh, Jenna Malley Dillon. I'll just say yeah, that. Yeah. Oh yeah. No, she's absolutely right about that. There's no. Absolutely no, right. You know what? Being no absolutely question. right. This is this isn't a uh, Kinsian uh, uh, Mike Kinsley uh, gaffe. Yeah. At all. This is just. She meant this to say is true. it. True. She didn't accidentally say the truth. Yeah. She came out and said the truth. And let me just say one other thing here while I'm ranting about it. All right. And that is, if a guy said that, the story would oh, have died yeah. in like three minutes. Right. That's just. I did see somebody tweeting, uh, you know, by the way, press, that's just locker, that's just locker room talk for ladies. Yeah, we, which you wouldn't know because like uh, most of you are, are uh, privileged white males who went to college and that's going to be the next part of our discussion here. Oh. Because again, I'm still fascinated by the fact that, okay, this is all true about oh, Trump that, and about his minions oh, and yeah. about his enablers and everybody knows it. And everybody knows it to the point where the reporters are now allowed to write about it. And yet, yes, he still got 70 some odd million votes and people in rural areas still wound up voting for him. So, uh, I, as you know, I've been semi obsessed about why it is why that it the is. Uh, uh, rural conservative voters would uh, uh, essentially uh, decide that I don't really care what else is going on. I'm voting for this um, General Malley Dillon person. Mm. Right. Yeah. And uh, I was listening to a, a podcast that David Shore did with uh, Chris Hayes, hmm. uh, which uh, one of our listeners kindly uh, uh, sent along to me and said, this is really interesting. And I listened to it. And you know what? It was really interesting. Oh, oh well, uh, good. Uh, also and, true. and David Shore yeah. was uh, talking about polling a little bit hmm. and was trying to make the point that, you know, one of the misses in polling this year wasn't just that in 2016, the national polls got it right and the state polls got it wrong. And so we said, OK, well, you know, that happens. And this year, the national polls, as well as the state polls, got it wrong somewhat. I mean, not terribly. Uh, the national polls were off by, you know, a couple points, but not nearly as accurate as uh, you were led to believe that the national polls would be based on what happened in 2016. And uh, uh, Shore was analyzing it david shore was saying okay so so why is it that this happened and it turns out it's really about the fact that uh uh white working class voters mm -hmm. are still a hefty uh plurality in this country and that the polling people were talking to them but they were talking to the wrong ones oh, well, the wrong ones in this sense mistake. okay what happens is people were so worked up, like I was just a few minutes ago, and Jenna Malley Dillon gets worked up, uh, mm -hmm. in opposition to the Trump administration and the Republicans, mm -hmm. that when pollsters call, they not only are eager to answer, in fact, if the pollsters didn't call, they would call the pollsters. <laughs> So oh, I am I'd so like to eager to it. tell you that I am not voting for Trump. Hmm. I'll write blogs about it. I'll do podcasts. And I'll even call you and say, why don't you interview me? Ask me the poll question. I just I can't wait. All right. If you're a Trump voter, uh, yeah, whatever. You know, I don't trust you. I don't trust anybody. Mm -hmm. I think you're all trying to take everything from me. And I'm not answering the phone and I'm not answering polls. And so there really was a, uh, a non-response uh, issue. When it came to white non-college voters. Okay. And the white non-college voters uh, uh, bias, the non-response bias, was in favor of Trump. And that's how he got his few extra points. Okay. And, uh, and so that circles back to, well, what is it about non-college voters that makes them think about uh, Trump as a potential, uh, you know, uh, acceptable Chief mm -hmm. Executive. And uh, uh, Shore made the other interesting point, which hadn't clicked with me until he said it. And then all of a sudden, the light bulb went off. And uh, he pointed out how the country is changing over time. So I sent to you this uh, little interesting graph from a place called Statista. Oh. 
All right, let's Percentage of U.S. population who have completed four years of college or more from 1940 to 2019 by gender. Mm-hmm. All right. And, and let me take you back to uh, 1952 uh, uh, and 56, approximately, because I don't have every single year. But in 1952, uh, and you'll see why I'm going to those years, Let's male uh, college attendance uh, throughout the country uh, percentage of the U.S. population completed four years of college, male uh, 8.3 and female 5.8. So in 1952 and 1956, less than 10 percent of the country mm. uh, had completed four years of college. Yes, and in 1972, that number was 15 percent for males and 9 percent for females. Now, by uh, the 2000s, male and female caught up and now – it's uh, 36.6% female and 35.4% male. Uh-huh. So we've gone from less than 10% mm. of the country being uh, four-year college ed- educated in the 50s to about 15% for at least for males in the mm. 70s. Now we're up to uh, 35, but 35 is still far from a majority. Yes, okay. still. Why pricing. those years? <laughs> 52 and 56 was Adlai Stevenson. 72 was McGovern. Hmm. Okay. And and David Shore made the excellent point that, look, you can't run a college, you know, because everybody knows that, hey, college plus is going for the Democrat this mm-hmm. year. Right. But you can't win on a college plus agenda alone because you're not the majority. Right. And you were really not the majority in 72. And McGovern, David Shore says, ran a college plus agenda. He got clobbered. Uh, yes. He got absolutely toasted. And that was because it was only 15 percent of the population. Even now, it's only 35 percent. So if you're going mm-hmm. to run an agenda that's uh, NAFTA, free trade, uh, you know, college plus uh the uh, Macrons of the world uh, really like this. You know, that's not going to appeal to 65 percent of the country. Yes. Although Even it, now, of course, and, and in those be... days, it wasn't going to appeal to 85 percent of the country. Uh, not directly. Yeah. There was a so, di- there was a time when people said, well, I, college plus people are the people we trust to run the country. So, well, OK, I don't understand this trust stuff. Dissolving, but, yes. Right. OK. Yes, that's right. gone. That's been gone since the uh, opioid epidemic and certainly uh, the Great Recession. Yeah. Uh, you know, that elected Obama. And so, you know, when you put all of that together, the lack of social trust, the uh, uh, still the the uh, larger majority of non-college uh, in the U.S. and you put them together and uh, you see that, especially in rural areas where life is changing and they're not real keen about it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it isn't the point is it isn't just economic anxiety. It's it's social mistrust. Uh, with a dollop of I don't want to see things change plus racism. It's not just any one thing. It's all of those things. And that, again, circles back to our discussion that we had a few weeks ago about the diversity of the uh, uh, Latina population. Mm-hmm. And uh, if you look at it in terms of college, non-college, their uh, tending toward Trump uh, makes more sense than if you look at it as a pure, well, he's a racist, how can you possibly vote for him? Yes, that will make it confusing for you. Right. So, so the uh, the Still, college non college divide <laughs> kind of uh, you know uh, it it really uh, uh, hits home there. And and what re- I was reminded of as David Shaw was talking about this in the McGovern debacle is uh, you know back in the seventies there was a big huge divider, which which brings home how important it was, mm-hmm. and that was the the Vietnam War and the draft. Yes. If you were in college, you got the ferment. Right. And if you weren't in college, you were going to Vietnam. And so yes. if you want to see how that divide works out in real life, there it is. And so it was no surprise that, uh, you know, long haired uh, protesters walking past the construction site who uh, was uh, staffed by members who probably didn't go to college and whose kids may not go to college. And so uh, things got violent. And, you know, there's a lot of fighting. And, and for the most part, the college kids got beat up. Yes. I mean, that really happened. And and so this whole stark divide between college and non-college was never more, uh, you know, obvious then. Now it's more subtle. But, you know, that divide is still there. Mm. Yes. 
and uh, uh, causing other problems of its own. Although I was thinking about the fact that it's gone up from 10% to 30%. This is the sort of thing that they usually say uh, they can lower the price because they make it up on volume. And, and yet that has not happened. So put right. that in the files with trickle-down economics. And, right. Uh, uh, now, 35% of people going to four-year schools, again, brings into context the whole idea of who would be helped by uh, forgiveness of college loans. Hmm. Uh, 35% of the public might, but that means, uh, uh, you know, 65% might not. So you have to put it in terms of how it helps the 65%, Right. Um, you know, or it's not going yeah, anywhere. That money. Uh, and that's true for just about everything else as well. So this has to do with messaging. It has to do with explaining what happened with the vote and what's going to happen with future votes. It's going to be uh, really important in terms of why you should never assume that uh, uh, black, brown, people of color uh, are automatically going to be Democrats. That ain't true. Right. Uh, and you have to throw in that college, non-college thing. Of course, you have to throw in the uh, the uh, religion evangelical part of it to see mm -hmm. where information is coming from and how people vote along those lines. So uh, elections are complicated. People are complicated. Uh -huh. But, uh, you know, it just I think this is all fascinating uh, uh, background information. Uh, and when people say to me, well, you know, it's a turnout election like in Georgia. Georgia is a turnout election. People will turn out. You just have to get uh, your side to turn out. No, okay. you have to persuade because the people that you think are turning out on your side may not be on your side. That's not if you haven't spent your time trying to persuade them to be. And so that's the message. Okay. Well, I don't know who needs to hear this, but that's a popular way of phrasing things on the Internet, so that's the way we'll do it. I don't know who needs to hear this, but uh, well, you just heard it. So you're not here if you need to hear it. But uh, I don't know. Play a uh, podcast for your neighbors if they need to hear it. But I, I would tell you who to play it for, but I, I don't know who needs to, to hear it. it sure. Oh, okay. Why is this happening, it's called, and go ahead, take a listen, it's really good. Hi, it's me, David Waldman, your host for KGRO in the Morning, and I've learned that I either need to update these announcements more often, or stop saying that the announcements are brand new. What's not new is that this message, too, is a call for your support in keeping the KGRO in the Morning show on the air. My thanks go out to all of you who do support the show through your donations. The stats say that KGRO in the Morning fans download our program about 2,000 times each weekday. But our donors make up only about 8% of our daily listeners. Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, makes it simple to make easy, secure, recurring monthly contributions to support our show. Patreon.com slash KGROX gets you straight to our donation page. If we're helping keep you sane during the Trump era, consider what that's worth. A dollar a day? Fifty cents. One thin dime. We do about 20 shows a month, so pick a number, do the math, and head to patreon.com slash kgrox to let us know. Thanks again, everyone, for all your support. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue with Greg Dworkin. Uh, I'm told I have a surprise in store, but uh, we've got into a whole different conversation about that uh, the interesting well, statistical I, I, I want to finish up the college, college stuff again. It's good. also a reminder that going that. to college isn't automatically a uh, you know a liberal bastion that's going to open your eyes about how the world works. True. Um, for guess. example, uh, here in Connecticut, uh, locally, uh, mm -hmm. we have some uh, excellent uh, for your colleges. Uh, you know, but uh, if you go to Sacred Heart, which by the way is a uh, Catholic university started by the bishops, non-sectarian, a little different than their rival Fairfield, which was started by the Jesuit order, because usually the colleges uh -huh. you know come from an order. But the bishops, uh, you know, that started Sacred Heart a little I different. See, you come out of one of those schools, you're not automatically going to be oriented toward being liberal versus conservative. Uh, you know, and That's if you true. go to a teacher's college or if you go to Liberty University, you're not necessarily going to come out of here as a progressive. So uh, the whole idea of going to college is automatically you're going to be a Democrat just wow. absolutely is not true. So in uh, addition well, to the sure. fact that That's it's fair. only 35 percent of the population, 30, you know, 100 percent of that 35 are not going to come out uh, voting Democrat. So, yeah. uh, you know, it's it's a really complicated mix. People are complicated. And I just think, it, you know, it's all interesting when you put it in the mix. It's not pure racism. Uh, it's not uh, pure uh, economic anxiety. Mm -hmm. But there is a level of uh, uh, social distancing, social uh, uh, disconnect, social disengagement. I see. 
that, that makes uh, people not trust government and therefore uh, uh, tend toward uh, the Republican Party that says uh, you got to go state level because uh, national government is terrible and corrupt. No. All and right. we can't do anything. And the best thing to do is to make it smaller. Hmm. And, and that is a very appealing message that needs to be countered, but it can't just be countered with uh, vote for me, not the other guy, because the other guy sucks. Hmm. Uh, but, you know, yeah, you can try some of that. that I'd say very well, we're seeing that in Georgia. Through. It isn't just enough that Loeffler and Purdue are crooks. Everybody knows they're crooks. Everybody hates Mitch McConnell, but he delivers, you know. Hmm. So he keeps winning his elections in Kentucky. So yes. you, you have to have something Allegedly. compelling uh, in order to win your election. And again, that's just a reminder. Now, we happen to have two excellent candidates with compelling messages in Georgia, but they have All to right. run their own campaign, not just against the other person. Hmm. So I was just telling David during the break that, you know, my favorite tweet of the morning hmm. yes. uh, was from uh, Mr. Rob Ballantyne, hmm. who reminds us today is the winter solstice, the shortest yes. day of the year and a reminder that the darkness passes, oh. uh, unless you keep so voting it back in. Oh, <laughs> all right. I was going to say, well, that's a nice uh, platitude. Oh, wait. Okay, so there's more to it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Don't vote. Don't vote darkness. Don't vote darkness. So there's a lot of darkness out there, and the fact that Trump is talking about, even talking that's where about, where democracy dies, even ranting about uh, impounding the voting machines and talking oh, about yes. martial right. law, Josh Marshall law. Uh, you know, is 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 bad. Law. It's a bad thing, and so uh, you know, it's uh, it's something absolutely positively keep an eye on. Now, the other big story, in mm -hmm. addition to the uh, only thirty days left of this incredible chaotic uh, uh, administration, Morning Consult yes. had a poll this morning. Trump is leaving the White House, but nobody expects him to go away. Ah, okay. About half of voters think Trump has changed the GOP for the worse. Voters were asked whether sure. they think President Trump has changed the Republican Party for the better or worse. All voters, 37 percent say better. That's that 37 percent core. Remember, when you get 46 uh, percent of the voters, so whatever it is he got, uh, that mm -hmm. other 9 percent is going with that message we were talking about before the break. That in their own area, things aren't good, and so on. The, the federal government, you can't trust, and so I'm voting for mm. smaller government. That's that 9%. They're the persuadables that you can get. The 37% core, forget about them. They're, they're not moving. You just have to have vote them. 23% of the public uh, you know, supported Nixon at the time he left. So that's my reference, and uh, it doesn't get lower than that. Uh, now, 51% of all voters think that the, the GOP has gotten worse, and again— uh, that's 53% of women and 50% of men. So, you know, there's not that big of a gender gap there. Mm -hmm. Now, Democrats, 80% think the GOP has gotten worse. Republicans, only 15, one, five. But if you go by community, uh, urban areas, 53% think the GOP has gotten worse under Trump. Suburban, 57%. That's that college group. Mm -hmm. Uh, and rural, forty uh, percent think it's gotten worse. Forty-six percent better. So that's not uh, incredibly uh, strong numbers for the GOP as it is today. And there are persuadable voters out there, even in rural areas. And there are Democrats in rural areas too. And there are people of color in rural areas. Uh, but again, you have to have a message uh, that uh, resonates. And uh, there are places, and we've talked about this, like South Texas, where jobs are scarce, and they happen to be in the oil industry. That if you come down there as an environmentalist, uh, you better have a good pitch hmm. if you want those voters, you yeah. know, because, you know, the campaign has to fit the area. So, uh, you know, it, I, I think after Trump leaves and he doesn't have the same kind of megaphone, and he doesn't get treated with the same kind of deference that hmm. even now, even in the midst of everybody reporting that he's nuts and that his uh, uh, enablers in Washington, uh, you know, are literally, you know, fuckers. Hmm. Wow. Even though people will say that now, yes. uh, they still get treated with kid gloves. And after he leaves in 30 days, uh, you know, the descriptions are even going to get harsher, as they oh. should, as they should have been all this time. Wow. So we'll see what happens and what people those. think about the Republican Party after that. Okay. I mean, I'm all for, you know, real creativity and coming up with names for them. And uh, it creates a little extra work and... Uh, you know, for the people who have to bleep these things. But I guess we don't have to. Maybe in a post, uh, it would, no, I don't know. Uh, it seems ridiculous to say that after the uh, Trump.
Trump administration is out of office that we would stop worrying about such things. We should have let it go for the last four years, but I don't know. All right. Well, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing so, what kind but, of But here's the practical aspects with. of that. This is from oh. Doug Hay, who is a former high-level staffer. This is part of the morning council story coming. Okay. for the Republican National Committee and former House Majority Leader Eric Cantor, mm-hmm. who endorsed Biden ahead of last month's election. Four years of being president, which comes oh. with more than $200 million raised since the election, however many Twitter followers he has now, that's real. And contrary to his predecessor's inclinations to step back from the spotlight, people close to the president's political apparatus expect a longtime celebrity to remain laser focused on garnering coverage. Of course, that coverage might be about his indictments, but we'll see how that goes. Yeah. And uh, Morning Consult makes the point for Democrats, that means the continuation of a tried and true boogeyman that has helped to energize the political efforts. Because if Trump doesn't go away, uh, uniting around anti-Trump works. Okay. While for Republicans, it sets the stage for rising GOP stars and budding candidates in Republican primaries to try to emulate and woo Trump in their own ways. Mm. But, uh, you know, that means that Josh Hawley has to develop charisma, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Tom Cotton has to become a celebrity. And it's not so easy. You can't just turn that kind of thing on and off. You either have it or you don't have it. And those guys don't have it. They may have a Trumpian message, but they mm-hmm. don't have a Trumpian personality to go with it. No. And you have to have that plus uh, the absolute uh, ability, 100%, to uh, remove shame from your personality. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, it's, that's a very rare thing. And uh, uh, that's why in... in uh, uh, Isaac Asimov terms, Trump is the mule, you know, ah. he's the exception that, that comes along that uh, nobody really saw coming. Hmm. So it's true that at the moment, Trump holds enormous sway over Republican voters. But what happens when the grift is exposed? And uh, we don't know that yet. So we'll yeah, have to see how that plays out. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know. I, I don't know whether they buy into the the fact of the exposure or not. But uh, in addition to which, he just uh, I mean, there's no rules with this guy, and he just blows past the reality that uh, people can see about him and whatever. So I, I think no he exposing. fades. I think he's diminished. But here's so. the problem with uh, what does happen, and this is from Monkey Cage from blog mm-hmm. from uh, Washington Post. These right. are the political so. scientists looking at this. Uh, Biden wants to bring Democrats and Republicans together. Here's why that's so challenging. Oh. And, uh, you know, too long didn't read. The subheading kind of sums that up uh, very nicely. Legislators worry that if they compromise, they'll lose their next primaries. And yes. that, in a nutshell, oh. is why it took so long to get COVID relief. Hmm. Everybody knew it was coming. Yeah. Everybody knew the uh, framework of the deal. They couldn't pull the trigger and get the Senate to go along. Mm-hmm. The House was ready months ago. So it's a Republican prob- problem, not a congressional problem. But the Republicans were afraid that if they compromised with the Democrats, they'd be primaried and they'd lose. Yes. And that's why it was so hard to get them to the table to say yes. Yes. Remarkably, they're still, uh, I guess, still the bulk of Democrats running for election in their district saying my big selling point is that I not only want to but can create bipartisan compromise. Well, again, this is not a both sides thing. You know, this is Republican side. Whatever yeah. the art, article says. In other words, they're talking about how well can Joe Biden work with Republicans. Mm-hmm. And the problem is uh, Republican. Oh, all mm-hmm. right. Yes. And the problem is uh, writing them out of the headlines and, and and then the body of articles discussing this. It's always it's still, you know, Congress right. doing all. Well, they stuff. wrote a book. Yeah. OK. In our new book, Rejecting Compromise, Legislators' Fear of Primary Voters, we investigated whether legislators believe the compromise is electorally risky. Because it's difficult to survey members of Congress, we turned instead to states, probing their willingness to compromise across a host of prominent issues. In 2014, we emailed a survey to all state legislators and had a 5% response rate. The 257 legislators who responded were representative of the full population, while Democrats are more likely to respond does this sound familiar? We were just mm-hmm. talking about this. Yes. 43% of the sample were Republicans. Among the legislators who responded, nearly a quarter said they'd vote against a compromised gas tax proposal that would move the existing state gas tax halfway toward the level of taxation they prefer. And both uh, sides rejected this as half a loaf. And we right. observe such behavior in action. And we followed up our initial survey with another one. 
that we distributed at the 2017 National Conference of State Legislators Annual Legislative Summit in Boston, be virtual these days. The 215 legislators who took the survey came from 44 different states, both parties, one-third of them Republicans, two-thirds Democrats. We asked these lawmakers how donors, primary voters, and general election voters would respond if they supported a compromise without giving specifics. And most of them, over half, 58%, said they thought voters in their party's primary election would be either somewhat or very likely to punish them if they compromised. Uh Uh-huh. Yes. When we asked open-ended questions, many legislators' comments reinforced this when asked whether they could name a time somebody lost a seat because of a legislative compromise. One attendee wrote that it would happen in a contested primary, not a general election. Another put it even more bluntly, in my state, primary voters are probably the biggest deterrent to legislative compromise. Hmm. And fear of punishment may be even higher in U.S. congressional elections where a legislator's voting record is more likely to make news or be advertised by relevant interest groups. But again, we have the situation where the House is in gerrymandered districts where it's even more true. If you're in Mark Meadows' district, not much pressure for you to compromise. Whereas if you're running statewide, Hmm. uh, there is. Yeah, true. Okay. So there you have it. Those book. are part of the dynamics Get that make it very difficult. To, you know, so everybody likes to yell at Nancy Pelosi because she's a lightning rod. You know, I don't really care. Yell at her. Uh, uh, why didn't she do this months ago? Mm. Because nobody wanted to. Mm. Right? They said on, on in public they well, wanted to. Yes. But they didn't really want to because uh, the Senate was not ready. The Senate wasn't in anything close to ready. The Senate isn't really ready now. Right. There's only well, you have one shot uh, if you live in Georgia. So you have, the you have one. You're talking about a quarter of the of the, of the legislatures uh, legislators up there mm-hmm. being useless. I mean, you're talking, you know, the Senate, yeah, not the House, and half of the Senate, and that half of the Senate just has no incentive to compromise. And the last thing in the world they care about is helping their constituents. The thing they care about is, am I going to get primaried and is it going to hurt me for re-election? Yeah. Well, generally speaking, yes. Generally speaking, yes, and specifically even more so now. Yeah, so that's two yeses, generally yeah. and specifically. So I just that that goes to answer the question of how we why does it take until the last minute to get anything done? Because this. Uh, yes, also he, they're humans, but yeah, I mean a lot of them well, are terrible you know, humans. I should point that lately out. Lately, more you know, again as as college levels have risen, so has uh, you know uh, uh, roadblocks. And uh, uh, delay yes, well, in the Senate. I mean, it's just it's been you know, over true. recent years, just getting worse and worse and worse. I will. I say that uh, when I mean, college teaches you a lot, but it doesn't exactly fix the wait to the last minute to fix things problem. <laughs> no, I think it reinforces that. Doesn't <laughs> yeah. It? So uh, yeah, you know, there's that. Maybe that's it. We need to have less people go to college. Yeah, so that they not don't... due for three days. Yeah. I got you know, I can party tonight. Right. Right. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's supposed to teach I mean, study. you, I mean, you know, better I mean, management yeah. skills, but uh, yeah, whether it instills I'm studying or not, my fellow human beings know. over at this bar. Right, and so everybody's a sociology major tonight. Yeah. Okay, well, another interesting uh, angle on all of this. Uh, I'm still, yeah, hmm. I can't believe they can't bring the, the, the cost of, of college down with so many more consumers opting for college. You'd think the prices would be lower. Well, you know, individual instruction is expensive. It is, and uh, and you have to increase capacity at an enormous rate, I guess. You and you can't just do it with adjuncts. Uh, no, but you can try. That's what they like to do, because oh, yeah. that way you don't have to pay them benefits and you pay them nothing. Speaking of, uh, you know, taking the lowest uh, totem pole, to, I don't know if you saw, mm-hmm. uh, but there are areas of the country that uh, are having pushback against the idea of how not just uh, whether you get a vaccine people are eager for the vaccine Hmm. but uh, who do you give it to marco rubio marco rubio but not the interns and residents there were uh hospital systems Ah, who were uh, allocating vaccine to the senior radiologist and pathologist who never sees a patient Yes, but they're seniors. And last on the list were the interns and residents who were there 36 hours at a time on the wards with the patients. Right. But, you know, they don't get paid that much relative to the senior docs. They're the ones that are on call at night and weekends and holidays. Uh. They're the ones with the patients. But, no, they're last. Yeah, that is, uh, well, that's 
I guess that's akin to uh, that. so that's going to be fixed. Marco that's going to be reallocated. Yeah, there was also going to be some reallocation of uh, who gets the vaccine first, mm-hmm. and it looks like it's going to be over seventy-five uh, and uh, frontline workers, and then after that, uh, over sixty-five and other essential workers. And so it isn't just uh, you know uh, being over sixty-five. Sixty-five to seventy-five is a different group, second group, second tier compared to 75 plus. So those adjustments are being made by CDC and the advisory group to FDA, and that's all reasonable. Mm-hmm. And uh, the the groups making that are also fairly reasonable. So there's always yeah. controversy about that because uh, what this shows is that everything in medicine, and that includes insurance mm-hmm. and Medicare for all and uh, 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 single payer systems, all of these things involve trade-offs. Yes, and when the trade-offs are done in public, people get upset about it, but not nearly as much as when you don't make them public. So mm-hmm. this is where you have to do it. Yes. And for people to consider ideas, discuss them, and then bring up more ideas and then discuss them, perfectly reasonable. So there's nothing wrong with, okay, here's our first shot. Our, our first draft wasn't perfect, and we got feedback, and now we made adjustments, and now the adjustments are better. I'm fine with all of that. You know, I don't really have a problem with that. This is not outrage, tear your hair out. I'm going to scream at this so that you, you, uh, you know, rage, uh, uh, click me so you could see more about what I have to say. It's actually all part of the process and it's fine. Yeah. You know, and it's working out okay. Uh, but uh, there will be those adjustments and there's a lot we don't know. And as we know more, we continuously have to make those adjustments. And in the new administration with the grownups coming in in 30 days, mm-hmm. what I expect is more messaging about, look, this is complicated. Here's what we're doing. And when we get more information, we'll perhaps do it differently. That'll be true for opening up uh, uh, grades K through eight. Uh, that'll be true for who okay. gets vaccine. That'll be true for roadblocks because Trump promises everything but doesn't give you details. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're better off giving details and not blocks. promising anything. Yeah. And so, you know, I don't know what the expectations are going to be for vaccine. It is rolling out and doctors are rolling up their sleeves and starting to get it. And that's great. That'll include residents and interns uh, who are always uh, uh, near and dear to my heart. Uh, physician assistants and nurse practitioners and all the people who are, who are actually and, and uh, people who clean the rooms and, you know, uh, SEIU and 1199 and all those those folks who are out there actually uh, working with patients to get stuff done really ought to be first. Uh, I'm a retired physician. I'm over 65. I'm perfectly happy to wait and not jump the line like Marco Rubio does. Yes. <clears throat> Another major story uh, from the weekend. But see, you understand uh, that we need to make these changes and that the the uh, advice and guidance will change along the way because you, well, I don't know if it's because, but it helps that you went to college to help you ex- explain those things. Uh, it is. It's it's kind of interesting. That's another part of the divide, just to, to tie those two subjects together. I'm thinking about the way you're describing. Well, you know, uh, we've got further information, and the situation has changed, and we've reconsidered, and we've gotten feedback, and uh, and it makes sense that we ought to make these changes. Which was also true about masking, and uh, we saw what the uh, what the the those who favor the non college crowd, let's say. Did with that one where uh, I don't know I don't think I don't know necessarily comes with correlation to education but I guess that uh, there's some sector of the public out there that believes the opposite that no you got to say the same thing all the time always or else you're wrong changing your mind is the real problem which I, again you know the, the I, I think the greater your education the less likely you are to believe something like that well you know maybe Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. We'll see. Maybe the price maybe. is too high. It so, cost you so much money to get that degree that you uh, were too obsessed with uh, that. What, what if you're, what if you're told every Sunday yes. that uh, <laughs> things shouldn't change and that yes. uh, you know the word as given that is college. what it is and should never be changed, and then your pastor gets sick and dies? Yeah, I don't know. What do you do with that? I don't know. We're going to find out because it's happening a lot in the Midwest. That's true. Uh, true. Happening everywhere. In, yeah, yeah, right. And uh, I guess another big uh, coronavirus development over the weekend, I have to at least take note of the um, what appears to be the emergence of a strange strain, a little bit, uh, they're saying, more tra- easily transmissible 
apparently locusts around the UK at the moment. So now and South Africa, a definite maybe. Here's that. a story from the New York Times on mm. that. The coronavirus okay. is mutating. What does that mean for us? Yes, me. Which personally, could be what does that mean for you? Dot s. Dot. Oh, okay, yeah. US, oh, us. Oh, you know, same thing. Yes. Uh, Officials in Britain right. and South Africa claim new variants are more easily transmitted. There's a lot more to the story, scientists oh, say. Okay. Just so you know. So, uh, yeah, we have sure. to keep an eye on that. Uh, and uh, does that matter? Uh, it's likely, as my friend uh, Ed MD says, that uh, the, the vaccine's going to cover this anyway. So okay. uh, don't get nuts about it. It's not that uh, different. Boris Johnson says, uh, when the virus changes its method of attack, we must change our method of defense. Now, I'm not sure whether Prime Minister Boris Johnson is using this uh, oh. changing, mutating virus to justify more stringent lockdowns. People on Twitter, and this is where Twitter really comes in, that picks up stuff that uh, simple news reporting doesn't always do in terms oh. of nuance. Okay. People on Twitter have just made note of the fact that if they happen for business to still be traveling between, let's say, D.C. and uh, London or D.C. and New York, oh. They are struck, if they're London-based, by how many people in New York and D.C. are wearing masks and how few in London are. Is that right? Yeah. Not, <laughs> that huh? was pretty striking when they said that. Really? Said, yeah. I mean, people huh. in London are not wearing masks. People in New York so, are. Okay. So, like, I, I, well, I don't know. know. What? They don't necessarily get the flu shot every year. We do. Uh Okay. I mean, it's just it's a different way of looking at things in a sure, different tradition. And so, that, but... yeah, again, everything has to be local. In South Africa, the story says a similar version of the virus has emerged, sharing one of the mutations seen in the British variant, according to science who detected it. Hmm. And that virus has been found in up to 90 percent of the samples whose genetic sequences have been analyzed in South Africa since mid-November. So, so they're seeing uh, a lot scientists of are worried about the variants, but not surprised. And uh, it's a real warning that we need to pay attention but the estimate of greater transmissibility is based on modeling and has not been confirmed. Okay. So uh, the fact that the thing is changing is important. Those changes may already exist and may already be responsible for what we're seeing or may not really be the factor. It's hard mm. to know. Yes, uh, and estimates about is. what it means in terms of the I infectivity rate are, are just that and unknown really in terms of confirmation. And several experts urge caution, saying it would take years, not months, for the virus to evolve enough to re render the current vaccines impotent. Okay. No one should worry that there's going to be a single catastrophic mutation that suddenly renders all immunity and antibodies useless. That's mm -hmm. not going to happen. What about if that it? happens, it's a process over the time scale of multiple years. Okay. What about not if the virus is trapped under seas and a nuclear test hits it? And then... Right. What about ICE-9? Yeah. Uh, okay. The scientific nuance mattered little to Britain's neighbors. Worried yeah. by the potential influx of travelers, the Netherlands said it would suspend flights from Britain from Sunday until yeah, January. We're doing this. So again, people, uh, uh, politicians are always prone to overreact or underreact, and mm. scientists who uh, suggest caution tend to get ignored. Uh, so you know, uh, and and it's not good for clicks. So cable news is all over it. But okay. uh, that's really the story there. So it's something we have to watch. It doesn't necessarily change much of anything at this particular point in time doesn't tell you to wear a mask, not wear a mask. We already know you have to wear one. Yeah, so why uh, not? You know, it, uh, should you get the vaccine when it comes along? Absolutely, you should. Uh, here's another point about vaccines I thought was awfully interesting that I saw somebody make, and it's a short one, so we can okay. get this in before the break. Yes. And that is that they've noted that uh, uh, minority communities, people of color, uh, often uh, are vaccine hesitant. Hmm. But sure. rather than look at it in terms of why are those communities hesitant? Really, the emphasis ought to be on why are the institutions that are suggesting the vaccine mis and distrusted? Mm. That's the better question to ask. Okay. Right? Who's yes. your messenger? Uh, who do you trust? And if you don't trust, uh, let's say, your local hospital system, why? Mm. Yeah. Those are the questions why? you have to be asking if you want to get the vaccine out to people. True. Don't don't make it like well, there's something Those, wrong with that fact, community. The Obviously, to be we're answering. a better community because we agree, and they don't. You know, yeah. no, that's not what it is. What it is is, you know, there's a lot of reasons to mistrust your local hospital system, as well as trust them, mm -hmm. trust the individual doctors. But you know, the CEOs, the, the skirts and suits up wow. in the uh, you know in the central tower, uh, you know, they yeah. don't necessarily uh, have okay. uh, have uh, your interest over their bottom line. 
that that's uh, certainly very possibly true. Uh, yeah, that gives me a lot of ideas about what to talk about in the second half as well. Lots of stories. I'm sure. Giving yeah. you ideas to talk about. Uh, sure. Let me throw Taking you one it, more it, thing before I just give you a chance to say, wah, about uh, something terrible. Uh, uh, Dr. Burks. What? Uh, <laughs> yes, Dr. Burks, uh, who I've never been a fan of, as people yes. who listen to the show know, uh, apparently uh, told everybody to stay home and don't travel. And then, of course, she uh, got together with her family because, like, it was holidays. Uh, yeah. So because she's like what? a total hypocrite. Did she think that, uh, well, my family, you know, is taking care of themselves because I'm a doctor and so we're all immune from it or just. And, and, and the like funny Turkey thing is she's what? still making a pitch uh, for, uh, you know, job application. I want the Biden people to keep me on because, you know, I'm planting this story about how troubled I was and frustrated with the Trump administration. Yeah. You were part of the problem. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you're going to want to try and work to rehabilitate yourself if you, if you can. It's just a natural inclination. But, yeah, I, I guess this one, it shouldn't work. Uh, I hope it doesn't. Well, this That's... is one of the more transparent things. You know, yeah, when, when Ivanka and, uh, and Jared leak stuff to Maggie mm. Haberman in The New York oh. Times, that's pretty transparent. This is along this. And when Mark Meadows uh, leaks stuff about I'm not from <laughs> Josh Marshall Law. Uh, this is in the same category. When Debbie Burke starts leaking that she was frustrated with uh, what the – uh, Trump administration was doing, mm. you know it's bullshit. Mm, sounds like it. All right. right? Well, yeah. And uh, 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 Jenna Melly uh, Dillon description, because uh, <laughs> she was okay with injecting bleach, and she was the one eh. that wanted to take over the data collection from CDC because it wasn't good enough for what her purposes were. And as a result, uh, we were flying blind for months. So no, no, not okay. Debbie Burks. Yeah. Just go away. Uh, well, good. So that's why I guess uh, I'm 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 glad to see that this other weird story is breaking. Like, I guess if you were at all becoming convinced that maybe she wasn't so bad after all, I guess the fact that she uh, well, look, everybody was saying don't travel, don't gather with your family for Thanksgiving, and millions of people gave that up, and she just you know she just didn't because because what she was misunderstood because I don't know. Uh, well, by the way, uh, Trump was threatening SCOTUS with disruption if they don't take his case, and so maybe you can do that after the oh. break. I'll see you on Wednesday. Well, send me that, and uh, I'll take a I will. I haven't we'll seen go it from there. Okay, very good. We'll see you on Wednesday. Uh, between now and then, I'm sure nothing of importance will happen, and we can just pick up where we left off. All right, welcome back now to the Kate Gordon Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. All right, I got some things here that Greg has left behind that we need to pick up on. Um, I guess I'll, I'll make mention of the fact that this story exists. I don't really know what to make of it, so I don't think I'll be discussing it in depth. But uh, Greg's mention of the uh, hospital CEOs and people like that at the uh, upper echelons of management in in the healthcare space sometimes not being trusted especially when it comes to uh vaccine mistrust et cetera et cetera uh just reminded me of it i, I don't have a great deal to to say about it cuz what is there to say about it but uh oh late breaking weekend news about everyone's favorite pharma bro martin shkreli i he's just can't stay out of the news this guy but uh uh, a story. I don't even know what to tell you. I don't. Know. I, I, I don't know where it was originally broken. I may actually have put it in pocket because I figured oh, we'll have to mention this thing. And, and really, that's about all I have to do because, in all likelihood, you have seen this thing and picked up on it. But I don't know what to tell you. Anyway, uh, very weird happening here. I, I just happen to have in front of me here the tweet from the. Is it the Daily Beast's tweet about their story about it? Uh, maybe i just recap it this way. A former Bloomberg News reporter has quit her job, divorced her husband, and frozen her, her eggs <laughs> for imprisoned former CEO Martin Shkreli, known as the Pharma Bro, who now refuses to talk to her. It's a very complicated story. And we don't know exactly what to make of this craziness. But uh, bottom line of it is uh, everyone trying to analyze this thing. I don't know. Uh, I guess she was in pursuit of a story. This woman reporter 
went to speak to Martin Shkreli. I don't know what she was hoping to discover. Um, long story short here is she, uh, I guess, convinces herself, I don't know, maybe it's real, or maybe she convinces herself that she has fallen in love with Martin Shkreli. Uh, many reasons to, I mean, that's crazy, but many reasons to uh, uh, expect. Uh, sure, that's crazy, but I could see how it could happen. Um, the, those reasons being, I, I would center them around. Uh, Martin Shkreli is kind of a sociopath kind of person. That's how he came to be famous. And very often they're quite adept, even in prison, at convincing people either one that they weren't guilty or that they were somehow victimized. And he's one in a long line of very strange cases of Im of imprisoned people generally i don't know i imagine it happens regardless of gender so maybe just leave that out of it imprisoned people who you know whatever develop contacts through whatever channels you're allowed to have contacts through and people who are in prison who get marriage proposals all the time and who who actually respond to some of those things and actually do start relationships with people such as you such as is possible when you're in prison but uh this happens with some frequency and uh, not difficult to understand that it could happen around people who are kind of sociopathic and have gotten I mean, like, how did Martin Shkreli come to be in charge of a pharmaceutical company at all and command the resources that he had? He's adept at fooling people into giving him money and deference and, so I guess it's not that hard to believe that it could happen in the uh, in the space that I, I'm guessing. I don't know what the psychology of both people is here, but I'm guessing in the space that at least this woman reporter recognized as romantic interest. It might have been something entirely different for Shirley. It might have been genuine, but then he changed his mind because apparently once he found out that the story was coming out, not the story that the woman reporter was reporting, but the other reporters reporting on the story of this relationship. He broke off the relationship and I don't know who cares what the motivation is for all that. I, I mean, but if you're inter interested in that kind of, I don't know, you could probably make a, uh, you know, an interesting uh, made for TV movie about it at some point. Uh, so, okay. Uh, I don't want to get too far into, you know, what motivates this report original reporter here but anyway now everyone's psychoanalyzing her and i can't do that and i'm not that good at it so uh there you go although the one aspect of this that i learned from the tweet was uh, i didn't i don't think i picked up on froze her eggs for this like uh all right well that was a very uh major commitment then of course she was uh, uh married uh, to well to someone else and uh, beforehand and uh, there's another life or maybe more than just one destroyed in in that as well just it's nuts it's weird it's out there martin shkreli refuses to go away and stop bothering people and making people miserable even by proxy and uh there you have it so news there and i uh, said would you would you take a vaccine from him there you go so i have vaccine tr mistrust issues if martin Shkreli is developing it, even though it's entirely possible that something, something, as a matter of fact, I think, and I don't know whether it was in part of this story, because I didn't, I couldn't sit down and read this story, or in the wake of this story or something, but I guess I saw suggested that at some point, Martin Shkreli, and it might have been the, the, the reporter who was profiling him, you know, who fell in love with him, or fell in whatever with him, uh, it, and uh, she may have been out there defending his record on this. I guess at some point in the coronavirus pandemic, uh, Shkreli suggested that perhaps one of the drugs in his uh, orphan drug arsenal, a leprosy treatment, uh, for whatever reason, that might be effective in addressing some aspect of the problem of coronavirus. I didn't read into it. Uh, and I guess everybody th thought he was crazy which he is, but crazy like about the medicine, which he may also be, but, uh, and, and dismissed it. And she was like defending because now she, the claim was that, uh, well, now uh, clinicians are coming around to the realization that perhaps 
no credit to Shkreli, uh, a drug that might help is this weird old leprosy drug. Well, the one weird old leprosy drug they don't want you to know about is in the, in the highly clickable ads, as it would appear. And uh, and she's saying, uh, this was what Shkreli was onto from the beginning. See, he really is a, a genius with special insight into the power of these pharmaceuticals. I can't evaluate that claim. I can't evaluate her bias. I'm just saying it's out there and, you know, more relevant than uh, perhaps we'd be, uh, we, than we'd care to admit. Uh, okay. Uh, in other, other, other news, just because, you know, it's of interest when something like this happens. It's not political. Uh, Kilauea is erupting. The volcano in Hawaii is so just a great topper for 2020. I don't think it's a super serious situation, but uh, I do see over at CNN that Hawaii residents are told to stay home, which is what you should be doing anyway, as Kilauea volcano erupts. So that's uh, that's of some interest too, if you happen to be there. And uh, I don't know where you're spending your time these days, Judy Vincent. Sometimes it's in Hawaii, sometimes it's in Texas. And I guess... Uh, for coronavirus sake, I would have hoped it was in Hawaii, but I guess for volcano's sake, <laughs> maybe Texas is the better bet. All right. Just sort of uh, thought I would throw that in there. I started the show with natural phenomena and the great conjunction. We'll throw a, uh, there's no reason not to share a volcanic eruption, I suppose, once you've gone down that path. All right. Let's see. Other things that Greg has shared here and sent after the fact, and there's still more. So I should catch up on all these things. Uh, more information about, uh, oh, cause I'll use this as background information with regard to the uh, fears about the coronavirus mutation and what it might be doing in the UK. And I had forgotten, yes, also South Africa. Although now that Greg mentioned that, I guess, Londoners weren't masking Rel at all or relatively aggressively maybe or I don't know but that 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 New York struck travelers from London as oddly I don't know whether they thought over masked but that they weren't they were masking at a level that London wasn't uh to then find out that there's this mutation which you know I mean it's a scientific fact either there's a mutation or there isn't so I'm buying into the fact that there's a difference in the virus but then the claim that we have to be careful of that this strain of the virus is more easily transmissible. I would guess there the grain of salt, I don't know, just offhand as a lay person, I'd say, well, you just told me you're not wearing any masks. Are you sure that the new strain is more transmissible or is it just that you guys are dumber and not wearing masks? And I don't know, some scientists probably think it's actually more transmissible, but, uh, but warning that we have to wait on the data. And in the meantime, why don't you see what the effect of uh, more aggressive widespread masking is on this new strain? That could be a study that you could occupy yourselves with while we all freak out. Uh, but Greg has sent uh, not only the New York Times article that he mentioned, the coronavirus is mutating. What does that mean for us? But there's also something new here, uh, but it's in German. So I can't read you the headline because whatever. But the excerpt here. Uh, is leading German virologist Christian Drosten is currently, quote, uh, and he's German, not very worried. We'll say it like that, but uh, I don't know. What, what is that accent anyway? I don't know. That was a little bit more uh, Eastern European perhaps than anything else, but he's not very worried. I, I couldn't really make that German sounding. Uh, about the coronavirus mutation in Britain. Uh, and this is not some inherent hatred for Britain, like, great, they're all going to die, but rather that it's not that troubling to him. He tells German national radio, and beware of German national anything, I always say, the information available so far is still very spotty. He might say, spotty, that we could do that. Questions, he, he does, he's also questioning whether the mutation is more transmissible. So I have to question the same thing. I'm doing it in English, not in German. But uh, you can see why. Also, a reminder from Greg, and yes, I have notes about this one too uh, to get to. This is a good news story for sharing the, the uh, and it has nothing to do with coronavirus except for the fact that the people who did the work were wearing masks. Good news. I saw some photos of those. The Robert E. Lee statue 
in the United States Capitol. You, you may, if you've ever visited the United States Capitol, you may have seen these things in the statuary hall or the rotunda down on the uh, ground floor and bottom floors of the, uh, the visitor accessible areas of the Capitol. Each state, I believe, uh, contributes two statues of, you know, I don't know what you would call them. I guess, uh, in the old days, I guess you could say local heroes, uh, persons of prominence for whatever reason and not necessarily heroic let's say but uh each state contributes two of their most statues of their prominent citizens of their choice and i don't know how the selection process works but we might be able to poke into that robert e lee for whatever reason well you know for the past 150 years uh, in virginia robert e lee was viewed in the wrong light <laughs> as a hero of the state and uh, it might strike you as odd in the modern sense. It might, oh, you know what, though? It might have struck you as odd in 1865, 1866, say. That's odd. I don't think the statue was ready at that point, but that's odd. He just rebelled against the United States, which, you know, the power of which resides here in the, in the Congress. And they were fairly dedicated, I think, here in the Congress to defeating Robert E. Lee. And now here is this statue. The statue probably showed up uh, at some point considerably later, when uh, the educational damage had already been done. Uh, th this, you know, for, like I said, for 150 years, they taught school kids in Virginia that Robert E. Lee was awesome and that he only reluctantly led the army of the Confederacy and that he was, and only out of loyalty to Virginia, after all. And, uh, Etc. Etc. So uh, anyway, that was the lesson they actually taught people that uh, right up until you know just a few years ago. In fact, I was having this discussion with uh, my brother and sister-in-law about their own kids, uh, young kids in you know taking middle school history and the difference. Uh, the, their kids are not that different in age. Uh, a couple of years is, is uh, ordinary, you know. And uh, but in the space of those few years. The older of their two kids have still taught in Virginia history. And there's a very specific Virginia history unit that they teach the kids in. It's not even middle school. It's grade school. I think the fourth graders do a, a Virginia history curriculum and they visit you know, Jamestown and they learn about the history of Virginia versus the rest of the country and the rest of the world. And part of that up until very recently was Robert E. Lee, reluctant hero of uh, of Virginia. And what a wonderful guy he was for various reasons, many of which are uh, biased or false. Uh, but that, uh, you know, a couple of years later, when their younger child went through the same curriculum, it had changed dramatically. And there was, and for the for the better, of course, just the way you would hope, that it had changed discussions of, you know, of slavery and how bad it was and how widespread the practice and how uh, uh, going to war for the Confederacy was a defense of slavery. And I don't know whether they got into the details that we learned or many of us have learned in, in more recent years about Robert E. Lee in particular and his v views and actions with regard to slavery. And I, what comes to mind here specifically the order to Confederate troops in the Gettysburg campaign that, uh, well, I guess in all campaigns, that, that uh, runaway slaves ought to be, you know, that this would be a, uh, a fruitful thing for troops to spend their time on rounding up runaway slaves and returning them to slavery in the South. But in the, during the invasion of the North and the Gettysburg campaign, uh, that free blacks, should be rounded up and sold into slavery in the South uh, because of, obviously, I don't know whether they even bothered with justification. The, the real justification was we're racist and this is what racists do. But I guess the uh, part of the justification might have been, uh, you know, well, uh, surely anybody who, uh, any free blacks here are in fact escaped slaves or at least descended from escaped slaves. So, uh, by rights, they ought to be returned to the South and into slavery. I mean, a particularly egregious uh, 
I don't know what. Particularly outrageous outrage. And I'm, I'm, I don't know what to say about it. It's, it's ridiculous. And, and, and not something generally, t- certainly nothing you would teach fourth graders in a pro Robert E. Lee Virginia history. Uh, but okay, things are changing and I'm glad for that. Uh, there's information in, in case you were wondering about well, who, who will be replacing Robert E. Lee in this. And I guess this gets at the question of how do you make this determination, uh, about who will be sent. And I, my guess is that it's actually probably a resolution of the state legislature, would make this nomination and approve it. And I don't know whether they do it by, who knows whether it's done with governor's approval or not as a joint resolution, whatever. But uh, I suspect that that's the case because that's the most natural place for it to reside, I would guess. Uh, uh, And also because the comment commentary about whose statue will replace Robert E. Lee's comes in this case from Eileen Filler Korn, who is the speaker of, the House of Delegates in Virginia, the the state legislature. So she's got the information. So my guess is that the decision is made there. Uh, She tweets, last night, the Robert E. Lee statue representing our Commonwealth, thank you very much, in the U.S. Capitol was removed. He will be replaced by civil rights hero Barbara Johns. I am pleased to know that from this point on, Virginia will be represented by a figure symbolizing inclusion, not division. And does she link to the ones with the pictures? Yes. Uh, She's got a WRIC TV, uh, ABC News affiliate uh, article about the removal that includes photos of the work. And they did do it in the uh, early morning hours when the Capitol Rotunda was empty because you got to have a lot of, there's some heavy, heavy equipment involved in getting this work done you can see from the photos so also uh very interesting i guess i added this morning in retweeting that news that we've had similar action here in loudon county to um rectify some of these other situations i also ah, yeah, here we go i also have a press release from the governor's office uh, about this change in the statuary here, and I might have some more information about this um, and the role of the the state government in making this selection. Uh, Governor Ralph Northam announced today that Virginia's statue of Confederate General Robert E. Lee was removed from the U.S. Capitol overnight. A representative of the governor's office was present for the removal, along with United States Senator Tim Kaine and Congresswoman Jennifer Wexton, my own congresswoman. Uh, Each state is entitled to display two statues in the National Statuary Hall collection. And for 111 years, that gives us the answer to when did this happen? Longer than I thought. 111 years, the Confederate statue has stood along with America's first president, George Washington, as Virginia's contributions, which, you know, given the way history was taught for 100 years, makes sense in that we were teaching kids a dumb version of history and a hundred years worth of Virginians grew up learning that we should be proud of, you know, producing these two kind of sort of fathers of their country. If you consider the Confederacy a country and a good thing, which it wasn't and isn't, but George Washington We're still doing pretty good on George Washington. People are a little angry about the way he got some of his teeth, uh, annoyed about uh, the fact that he remained a slaveholder throughout his life, but some people then say, but he freed his slaves Slaves after his death. Well, yeah, you know, that's an easier thing to do. So, uh, okay, controversial figure, but still by and large regarded as appropriate for statuary, I would think, yes, from Virginia, whereas Robert E. Lee... Yeah, really from the beginning, you should have known that that was a but, you know, there's there's many, many in-depth articles written about the lost cause mythology and how it got worked into, well, history curricula here in Virginia and elsewhere. So I guess, you know, it's a bad explanation, but it's an explanation. It rings true. It's just a bad thing that happened here. Anyway, uh, let's see. Uh, Right. So the two statues were added in 1909. 
which was 44 years after the Confederacy rebelled against the United States and was defeated. And there again, this is a proclamation from the Virginia governor's office. So this is a big thing. The Lee statue has had been one among 13 located in the crypt of the Capitol, representing the original 13 colonies. Uh, really, shouldn't the George Washington have been there? But OK, we should all be proud of this important step forward for our commonwealth and our country, said Governor Northam. The Confederacy is a symbol of Virginia's racist and divisive history, and it's well past time we tell our story with images of perseverance, diversity, and inclusion. I look forward to seeing a trailblazing young woman of color represent Virginia in the U.S. Capitol, where visitors will learn about Barbara John's contributions to America and be empowered to create positive change in their communities just like she did. Uh, earlier this year, Governor Northam signed legislation, here's your answer, establishing the Commission for Historical Statues in the United States Capitol. It's linked here uh, to the commission, so you can read all about it. Charged with studying the removal and replacement of the Robert E. Lee statue. The eight-member commission chaired by State Senator Louise Lucas. Uh, and isn't that who we read about, uh, uh, embroiled in controversy, not of her own making? About, but also uh, on the subject of Confederate statuary, right? In Was it in Portsmouth where she was being targeted for prosecution by the local authorities over this? Anyway, she's chairing the eight-member commission, uh, which voted unanimously on July 24th of this year to recommend removal of the statue. At the request of the commission... The Virginia Museum of History and Culture in Richmond, Virginia, will accept ownership of the statue. So it's not, uh, you know, being tossed in the river or anything. Confederate images do not represent who we are in Virginia. That's why we voted unanimously to remove this statue, said Senator Lucas. I am thrilled that this day has finally arrived, and I thank Governor Northam and the Commission for their transformative work. On December 16th, 2020, the Commission selected, this is very recent, Civil rights icon Barbara Rose Johns to replace the Robert E. Lee statue after receiving public input from Virginia residents during several virtual public hearings. Very interesting process. In 1951, 16-year-old Barbara Johns led a student walk out at Robert, is it Rosa? Robert Rosa Morton High School in Farmville, protesting the overcrowded and inferior conditions of the all-black school compared with those of white students at nearby Farmville High School. This garnered the support of NAACP lawyers Spotswood Robinson and Oliver Hill, who took up her cause and filed a lawsuit that would later become one of five cases reviewed by the United States Supreme Court in Brown v. Board of Education, when it declared segregation unconstitutional in 1954. Historians consider John's protest a pivotal moment that launched the desegregation movement in America. As of this morning, Virginia will no longer honor the Confederacy in the halls of the United States Capitol. It happens elsewhere still, unfortunately. Said Delegate John Ward, who sponsored legislation, I hope I haven't mispronounced his name, sponsored legislation creating the commission. When I think of Barbara Johns, I am reminded of how brave she was at such a young age. It's time for us to start singing the songs of some of the Virginians who have done great things that have gone unnoticed. This is a proud moment for our Commonwealth, and I'm humbled to have been part of it. The General Assembly must approve the replacement before a sculptor can be commissioned. If approved, Johns would complement the statue of Washington and would be the only teenager represented in the collection. Governor Northam has introduced a budget that includes $500,000 to replace the statue, Images of the statue removal can be found below. You can take a look when I send you the link here and should be accompanied by attribution for uh, Jack Meyer, Office of Governor Northam. So, Jack, thanks for taking those pictures. They're really good, too. So, photo credits uh, given there. That's nice and uh, really also looked like a lot of work. So, okay, we know what's happening to the statue. We know how the statue came to be replaced and how the decision was made and how things will be budgeted and uh, what decisions need yet to be made in order to get the ball rolling on this. is kind of fascinating. 
I can use this when I uh, spend time later in the week uh, counseling one of the scouts on the citizenship in the community. It's good. I love this process stuff, as you know. Okay, uh, so very important. Uh, we're coming up to our, uh, even more important than this, coming up to our next break. So keeping an eye on that. But I thought I'd throw in, as I did early morning on Twitter, here in Loudoun County, in addition to this news, there's news of renaming of local uh, highways, or at least the portion of highway that runs through our county, uh, Route 7. Uh, those of you who might actually be in the area, of course, very familiar with Route 7. Uh, it, known uh, in, in a lot of parts of Northern Virginia, maybe the whole damn thing, I don't know, as the Harry Flood Bird Highway, uh, former governor and U.S. senator from Virginia, but a segregationist. And uh, that, too, not just actual participation in the Confederacy will get your name booted off of the highway. Uh, and Route 50 in our area, John Mosby Highway, actually a very interesting figure, but a Confederate gorilla and maybe not worth being on a road name. Hi, everybody. It's me, David. Let's change things up from the old fundraising pitch for just a minute and talk instead about how you can be a part of our show. If you've got a smartphone or any other electronic recording device, why not sit down and record a segment for us? Read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Then send the file to me at kgrowx at gmail.com and I'll try and work it into the show. Short segments, a few minutes in length, are easiest to fit in. And of course, I can't always guarantee that I'll be able to play everything, but if you've ever shouted at your radio or TV about something you wish was being covered, here's your chance to change that. Make the show your own. Send your submissions to me at kagrox at gmail.com. Welcome back now to the Cake Girl in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Uh, shall we continue down this path? That is kind of fascinating, actually. Uh, so I mentioned to you that the names of the highways would likely change or maybe have been changed here in Loudoun County. And I've got a local piece on that from Loudoun Now, one of the local publications uh, that uh, uh, treats this. Loudoun Supervisors, the Board of Supervisors, our local uh, our county uh, uh, government, has asked to change. It says, ask to change Harry Bird and John Mosby highway names. Launch inventory of racist symbols. Seems like a good idea to get underway as well. And uh, just to make it, uh, uh, make one more connection that brings it back to the somewhat more personal. Again, I remind you that among the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors is my own supervisor, Julie Briskman, who, if the name doesn't ring a bell, is uh, the woman who became uh, famous early in the Trump administration, having been photographed riding by on her bike while he was leaving the golf course and giving him the finger. You remember that, right? Yes. And she also, uh, she then, of course, lost her job and uh, went on, as a result of that, went on, though, to be elected to our local county board of supervisors, uh, whose district includes the Trump golf course. So one of the uh, lasting ironies of all of that, and we're glad of it. And she then went on, of course, to participate in some of this decision making as well. And, and that's a nice result from this whole thing. So thanks, I guess, Donald Trump for that one. All right. County supervisors will ask the state to change names of Route 7 and Route 50, where they honor segregationists and will gather an inventory of other places in Loudoun that are named for racist figures. Uh, but I told you that Mosby was kind of an interesting figure. Let me run through this here. The supervisors voted seven to zero to two. I guess two absences or abstentions. I guess I guess they would be abstentions if they're noted in the record here. It would just be seven zero if they were just absent. Uh let's see. Uh two Republicans uh <clears throat> uh having left the dais for both votes. So I guess they didn't actually go and uh, abstain. They just walked out for whatever reason, and who knows? Maybe they just had to go to the bathroom. But I don't know. I'm sort of thinking that it was symbolic. Uh, anyway, so uh, let's see. This uh, I don't want to spend too much time on it, but uh, the motion made by uh, Vice Chair of the Board Corin Sains of uh, nearby Sterling District here 
The motion to start the process of renaming those two highways was made where they are named for lawmaker Harry Byrd, known for leading, quote, massive resistance, you know the phrase, massive resistance to integration in Virginia, and Confederate Cavalry Commander John Mosby. County staff members were directed to report back to supervisors with a process and cost estimate for changing those names no later than May. So once again, a little look inside the process here. As primary routes, the state has the authority to change those names. Sains uh, said naming those roads sends a message to both our residents and non-residents who use these roads about what kind of place Loudoun is. Confederates were individuals who willingly took up arms against the United States in order to preserve slavery. We should not be honoring those traitors, Sains said. If they had their way, uh, myself, Chair Randall, Supervisor Glass, we would most likely not be sitting in front of you here today. People of color, obviously, is what they're talking about. In 2015, Sains and County Chair Phyllis J. Randall were the first two black people ever elected, ever, in 2015, ever, elected to the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors. After the 2019 election, Loudoun's third ever black supervisor, Sylvia Glass, joined them on the dais. Glass recalled her own family's historic role in desegregating Virginia schools. Her family went to court to allow her sister to enroll in Prince William County Public Schools. She would be very happy to see we're doing something, that we're not glorifying someone who tried to keep my family and other families that look like me from going to public school, Glass said. Mosby has already lost some namesakes in Loudoun, and he may be less familiar to you. I mean, probably uh, Harry Flood Bird, not familiar to you at all if you're not from Virginia or nearby. Uh, but, you know, I've, well, that's been explained. Okay, one of the leaders of the massive resistance movement to desegregation. Mosby, though, you might not know as much about either. Mosby already lost some namesakes in Loudoun earlier this year. The Loudoun County School Board voted to remove the Raider mascot at Loudoun County High School, which was named for Mosby's, Mosby's Confederate Cavalry Battalion that he led in the area. The new school mascot is the Captain. Well, captain of what? Well, we don't really know. So there's, there's uh, some sort of uh, 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 non-determinative captain. Uh, anyway, uh, similarly, the former Mosby Heritage Area Association, and I mean, really, Mosby Heritage, uh, which this year marked a quarter century of preservation, advocacy, and American history education. Quarter century, that's like recent. Uh, it was broader than just Confederate stuff, but I mean, naming it Mosby in this area, the Mosby Heritage Area, also adopted a new name, the Virginia Piedmont Heritage Area Association. Much better. Supervisors also launched work to inventory public Confederate and segregationist symbols in the county with an eye toward possibly renaming those as well. That also passed 7-0-2. to zero to two. Um, Let's see. Uh, that inventory expected back in May or June. Our residents, especially those of color, shouldn't have to drive on, walk by, play in, or pay taxes to support public infrastructure that glorifies those who would tear us apart and tear our nation uh, apart and continue a system of racism and oppression well beyond the end of the Civil War. Thanks for that comment from our own Julie Briskman. These symbols only serve to hold up the infrastructure and even confirm false legitimacy of white supremacy to the benefit of populations and to the certain detriment of others. I will say it again, now on to Phyllis Randall here. We should learn history. We should know it. We should study it. We should appreciate it. But every part of history should not be celebrated, Randall said. And when you name things, streets, buildings, schools, after segregationists and people who supported the Confederacy, it is a celebration. It's not an acknowledgement of history. It's a celebration of that person, and they should not be celebrated. Very interesting. Uh, there's a bit more uh, about the... Uh, uh, I don't know, I guess the logistics of it at this point. Um, but just to jump out and uh, get on to other subjects, or at least I want to wrap this one up, though, and I'll let you know there's some controversy arising. There's less pushback about the uh, Bird Highway thing than there is about Mosby, as you might have guessed, both from my dropping the hints that he was an interesting figure 
uh, and in my like responses that I got this morning when I talked about uh, renaming this thing, that Mosby was a Mosby was a complicated guy. <laughs> but okay, so like I, you know, my my answer is Phyllis Randall's answer. Like, you remember him in history, put him in the books. But naming a street after him, maybe not such a smart thing to do. Uh, there is pushback though in one of the other local publications, the Loudon Times Mirror. Uh, a letter to the editor uh, from a local person, Evan Parrott. I don't know who that is, but uh, Evan's letter here. Keep John Mosby's name on Route 50 in Loudoun. Why? Uh, well, let, let him explain. I would like to introduce Mr. Corin Sains and the Loudoun County Board of Supervisors uh, to something that seems to be missing in all of the racially divisive and senseless recriminations that are rampant these days, a history book. Now, I don't think we're going to like the perspective he's coming from, but it exists is the fact that there's this pushback and there's germs of truth in there. It's just that I think maybe Evan Parrott might be doing the wrong thing with it. Anyway, and of course, uh, he's going to be needling them. He can't just have real discourse. He's got to be, oh, yeah, well, let me introduce you to something, a history book. Anyway, but specifically, he's talking here about the book authored by Fairfax County author V.C. Pat Jones, entitled Ranger Mosby, uh, published all the way back in 1944, if you're wondering for context. While it's true that Mosby fought for the con- Confederacy as a partisan ranger, with a never-collected bounty on his head. He also received a parole from General Grant after the war and even supported Grant for president in 1872, an unpopular action that caused him to leave his native Virginia. In addition, Mosby was named U.S. Consul to Hong Kong by President Rutherford B. Hayes and served several other U.S. presidents, including duties as assistant U.S. attorney in the Department of Justice appointed by President Teddy Roosevelt. I would encourage Mr. Sains and the board to be as generous as General slash President Grant, along with several other presidents, and reconsider the plan to strip John Singleton Mosby's name from highway markers. After all, he and his wife are buried in Warrington, Virginia, as if that mattered, and his name still brings lots of tourism dollars to the many communities of Mosby's Confederacy, of which Loudoun County is a part. Besides, equating Mosby with the egregious Jim Crow restrictions of Harry Byrd would not only be intellectually dishonest, but the equivalent of disqualifying senior members of the incoming Biden administration because their ancestors may have had connections to slavery. No, that's a gigantic leap and ridiculous. I can't even believe you actually went there with that one. But uh, yeah, Uh, look, the name doesn't belong on the road. That's fine. Uh, Mosby was an interesting figure. I'll direct you to his uh, Wikipedia entry if you want to read more about him. But <clears throat> just to get out of this, long story short on Mosby. Um, as a Confederate, particularly vicious, I think, and uh, a real problem for Union troops, which, you know, in the last hundred years has only just kind of excited people as they were taught about the nobility of the Confederate cause here in Virginia. But uh, what makes him interesting is that he was uh, post-war one of the, well, one of, I don't know how many there were, but uh, Confederate commanders weren't big on telling their people yeah, the war's over and we should get used to it and we should, uh, in fact, support the Union and, uh, and, and, and help heal the country to the extent that, that doing so is really healing anything. But okay. Uh, and so he, he, he didn't like continue on. There was actually, though, a period after the conclusion of the war. Of course, he, like I said, he was a guerrilla commander and uh, <clears throat> there was the opportunity anyway available to him to say, uh, yeah, maybe I'll continue to fight on. And there was some question about whether or not he would actually go ahead and do that after the war. Um, and uh, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not 100% certain whether he <clears throat> actually took any military action after the close of the war, but I don't think so. But it was certainly proposed to him and he considered it. But I think most famously he rejected the idea saying uh, with a uh, 
with a conclusion to the war having been negotiated by our commander, Robert Lee, at Appomattox, for us to continue military action after that. I mean, that applies to us. So he took a very legalistic view of it. And he said, you know, if we were to take military action following that, that would just make us murderers. We don't have the sanction of war, wartime, uh, to, to, to do this. And I mean, you know, in the, in the general sense of things, you know, murder is murder whenever it happens. But okay, I see what you mean. And you can see where his legal mind, I guess that leads him into the, the uh, continued practice at high levels of legal profession after the war. But okay, so he decides he's not going to do that. And it, he's going to encourage other people to take the same view. He becomes a Republican, which, you know, back then was a good thing, I guess, and supported uh, Republicans for president. And they rewarded him with jobs like, uh, like he said, you know, he's a high ranking uh, Justice Department official, which would these days would probably worry people. Wow, I don't know, an ex-Confederate in the Justice Department, probably not like a great step forward, maybe for justice or people of color in the name. I don't know how he was about that. And uh, I doubt he was reformed very much on that front. And I, I imagine people probably excuse that as well. You got to say, you know, he was a product of his times. And after all, he was a Confederate for a long time. But so I don't know how how, how much uh, conversion and enlightenment and epiphany there was about uh, uh, the need for uh, racial integration and harmony on his part, but he accepted the union. And so that's sort of a nice thing. And so, yeah, again, so I say to this person who wrote the letter and others who commented to me on Twitter, all right, so you put him in the books. He's an interesting figure. There's no reason to name heritage area after him, whatever that might even be, or roads or anything else. Nothing wrong with that. And also, as you know, for, for Evan Parrott, I would say, Name me another road anywhere named for a U.S. consul to Hong Kong, and we'll talk. Like, no, his name should stay on here. He wasn't just a Confederate general. He was U.S. consul to Hong Kong. So what? There, I've never driven on another road that I acknowledged at the time or now to be named after a U.S. consul to Hong Kong because they were U.S. consul to Hong Kong. I'm sure at some point somebody else who also was a senator, maybe have something named after him. And P.S. He was consul to Hong Kong, but I don't think that's I don't think that's quite the save that Evan thought it was. I suspect there's another motivation in there somewhere. Anyway, just interesting local angle, national angle, procedural angle, a lot to it. Uh, probably not where I thought I would spend most of my day when we got started, but I'm glad to be there now. That's. That's the way the show works. I'm enjoying it. Okay, let me see. Other things that, have, that uh, I haven't gotten to yet that need to be uh, discussed. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> All right, just acknowledging a photo that uh, Greg sent that uh, the German language version of Bob Woodward's book, Rage, is, well, it's out, and there's a photo of it. And I don't know. I guess if you speak German, you're not surprised by it. Or now you're laughing and saying, ah, I know where this is going. Apparently, the title uh, of Rage in German is what we would pronounce as what? Like W-U-T, like we use in Internet lingo, right? What? <laughs> it's just got, but it's got a big picture of Trump's face and it just says what? <laughs> so that's a good one. I like that. We'll see if I can dig that up in a way that's shareable. And uh, German speakers, let me know. Is that just a direct translation of rage or or what is what I would want to know? All right, let's see. Uh, I think now we're done with what, uh, Greg, what Greg had sent along. And we can charge back and dive back into pocket for the last couple minutes here. Let me uh, at least put this one on the record because we spent, we've spent a lot of time in the previous weeks and we haven't gotten back to it yet discussing uh, the last-ditch efforts, which won't work, from Republicans to uh, have massive resistance this time to the uh, election and inauguration of Joe Biden uh, with a floor fight about the Electoral College vote counting. The Hill has this piece that says Republicans 
at least some of them, desperate to avoid floor fight over electoral college vote. Jonathan Easley reporting this one for the Hill. National Republicans are desperate to avoid this whole thing, uh, believing it would be horrible politics to continue waging what most recognize to be a hopeless battle to overturn the outcome of the election. Here's where Mitch McConnell comes in. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell has intervened, asking his members in the Senate not to join Mo Brooks or any other House members looking to object to the results on January 6th when Congress meets to certify the Electoral College count. Uh, And there's a new player in that sphere. It's uh, mentioned here in the next paragraph. President Trump is waging a president uh, pressure campaign, sorry, to get senators to revolt. So that's always going to be interesting and fun, too. So uh, Trump who is about to go out of power, is telling senators, yes, you should object. McConnell, who is just reelected and is returning to power, although that power could be limited at uh, some point by the results in Georgia, is saying, don't do this. So now the new player comes in. Uh, Incoming senator, and I never learned to pronounce his last name, Tommy Tuberville, Tuberville, how does he say it? He's a football coach, so I could go, I'm sure, and find old tape of him being... Uh, discussed or interviewed and find out, but he's a jerk and I don't care, so I hope I'm mispronouncing it. Uh, Alabama's new uh, senator-elect, Tommy Tuberville, we'll say, probably is Tuberville, uh, who will be sworn in on January 3rd, of course. Uh, And yeah, it looks like they're going ahead with it on a Sunday, by the way, which is ordinarily uh, not done, but whatever. Anyway, he says he'll join the the floor fight and Senator Rand Paul has said he believes the election was stolen, is also, as they say here, always a wild card. He was always an early possibility for this. But Tuberville says he's in on it. Republican strategists are hoping McConnell can quash the insurgency, believing the debate over Trump's refusal to accept the outcome of the election is tearing the party apart ahead of the January 5th runoff elections in Georgia that will determine the balance of power in the Senate. So it may not necessarily be that... uh, Mitch McConnell thinks the whole thing is embarrassing and improper so much as, well, if it costs us Georgia, then it costs me my job as majority leader, and I don't want that. So don't do this thing because me. Will Tommy Tuberville care? Will he understand? Will he acknowledge the power of the majority leader to make his life miserable? Is there uh, the opportunity for the majority leader to make his life miserable. I I just sort of discussing this briefly in Twitter over the last couple of days when Tuberville first came out for this, you know, uh, McConnell will push back. But then I thought, you know, in all likelihood, Tuberville will end up getting some pretty plum committee assignments anyway. So he'll learn nothing from it. Like he'll fight with uh, McConnell over it. And People will tell him, you better watch out because McConnell can really make your life miserable. You're up for, you know, you're looking for good committee assignments right now. He can put you on real crap and make your life miserable, uh, which is true. And and he'll likely not get his first choices as a result. But uh, in the Senate, they're spread pretty thin, uh, especially, you know, now they're, what do they have, 52 seats and they have to populate all of these committees, as a majority, they need more Republicans on these committees than Democrats. And there's lots of committees, and there's only 52 senators to distribute among them. And there's just not a whole lot of opportunity to punish somebody like Tuberville and put him on, uh, you know, limit the number of committees that he sits on and give him crappy ones because other senators are spread too thin as it is to cover for him on committees with heavy workloads. So he probably won't suffer much as a result. Plus, of course, there's every possibility that since McConnell is only doing it to save the Georgia races, if he can, and isn't you know necessarily truly committed to not embarrassing the Senate because he doesn't care about that, then, uh, you know, uh, there might not be much in the way of pushback against Tuberville. And I, I don't know. It'll be very interesting to see whether there is any and whether it's measurable and significant. All right. So I think we'll jump out of that one there. Just want to put that out there and float his name as a possible uh, senator to sign on to this effort so that it's not entirely out of the question. I mean, we know what the results are going to be, 
but uh, still some question about whether or not they'll manage to get a Senate co-sponsor of the complaint so that they end up splitting up and spending two hours debating and then coming back with the results we all know uh, are likely. Okay, let's see. Uh, not much time left here. I guess I can do a couple of quick hits here. Uh, speaking of members elect of the new Congress, representative elect from Louisiana, Luke Letlow has been laid low by the uh, coronavirus. Can you believe it? I don't know if he was a big denialist or anything. He is a Republican, but uh, I don't know. He didn't seem, uh, you know, out of the ordinary in terms of uh, where he stood on this stuff. But he, uh, the interesting part of it is he has been hospitalized, his office says, as a precautionary measure, which... Uh, these days, I would think is relatively rare with uh, hospital capacity at a premium. I didn't know you could get admitted to the hospital for precautionary purposes only. Like, oh, I'm super healthy. Everything's fine. But as a precaution, in an abundance of caution, I'm checking myself into a hospital that is at 110% capacity. I don't know what it's like in the St. Francis Medical Center in Monroe, Louisiana, where he was checked in, but... That's the news. He uh, announced on social media Friday that he has tested positive for the coronavirus, was quarantining, but now uh, going to uh, jump in to the mix at uh, St. Francis Medical Center. Let me jump out of the Hills report and down to the Louisiana Monroe News Star uh, for this information. Right. So uh, Congressman-elect Luke Letlow has been hospitalized in Monroe as his COVID-19 symptoms persist. I'm doing fine, but I do have symptoms, but they won't go away and I'm going to the hospital. All right. Uh, as a precaution and under the recommendation of his doctors, Letlow is being admitted to the hospital on Saturday for monitoring as he is treated for COVID-19, uh, said his spokesman, uh, Andrew Bouch, who is also battling the infection, but I guess isn't going into the hospital. Uh, the, Letlow will represent the state's 5th Congressional District when, presumably, he takes office next month, assuming he's you know healthy enough to be there to do that. Uh, as If you're wondering, you know, where'd this guy come from? Uh, he apparently, uh, well, he won overwhelmingly, of course. There's 62% of the vote in a runoff election, anyway, against fellow Republican State Representative Lance Harris of Alexandria, he will therefore succeed his former boss, Congressman Ralph Abraham, who didn't seek re-election. After honoring a pledge to serve a term limit three years, Letlow had been Abraham's chief of staff. So some continuity there, uh, except for the fact that he's bringing uh, a coronavirus infection with him along the way. Okay, so that news uh, now entered on the record <laughs> with less and less time uh, left to... Uh, throw in a few others here. Let's see. Uh, oh, uh, an item or two from articles we began on last week. And we have uh, lots of things from the weekend that will enhance our understanding of what we read last week about the end of the Trump administration. Um, but uh, one of the items that emerged from the Washington Post's reporting about the decline in independence, the destruction of the independence of the, and, and uh, prestige of the CDC. One of the details that emerged from that reporting that Greg mentioned to you last week, that Ivanka Trump apparently personally intervened on behalf of the administration with the CDC's guidance about school reopening, uh, but in particular intervened in ways that were apparently all about uh, modifying or removing uh, information or the presentation of information in these CDC reports that were uh, detrimental to or, or um, disparaging in any way of, of her dad, who's, of course, unfortunately, the president of the United States. And uh, yeah, that would be a pretty interesting development as well. And it was covered in, in particular detail, as it turns out, by Vanity Fair as well. Maybe we'll share some discussion of that. Uh, also in the... Uh, widely read reporting over the last couple of days, a new detail uh, brought to light 
in Wall Street Journals. The Wall Street Journal is reporting on it, but of course it's behind a firewall. So I'll share with you this observation uh, from uh, Twitter account Zombie Bill Barr <laughs> discussing the Wall Street Journal's piece entitled Amid Vaccine Rollout and Historic Hack. Trump remains focused on reversing election. The uh, little tidbit that zombie Bill Barr pulls out this quote. In a recent get-together in the Oval Office, Mr. Trump began filling up bags with White House trinkets for his visitors, telling them he didn't know what to do with the items, according to a person briefed on the meeting. Uh, probably someone could help you out with what to do with them. But interesting, yes. So he's now filling bags with trinkets and I imagine silverware and uh, uh, China as well, even though he hates China. But uh, I still think he's going to probably see if he can't make off with the Resolute desk. Just put that on the truck and when you discover it's missing, they can give me a call and we'll see how long it takes me to respond and send the thing back to the White House. I imagine he's stealing all sorts of things from the White House. Certainly the trinkets, certainly the candies and M&Ms, etc. No doubt about that going down to Mar-a-Lago with him. Okay, time now to hand things over to Justice Putnam for the West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy coming up next right here on Netroots Radio. Stay tuned and uh, let me make a quick scan and see what jumps out at me as exciting and new. From NetroutsRadio.com You have been listening to K-Grow in the morning with David Waldman. Let's jump over to the international, shall we? Let's see. Uh, eight Katusha rockets exploded in Baghdad's heavily fortified green zone in an attack targeting the U.S. Embassy. And Putin told the spy agency responsible for the massive cyber attacks against the United States to keep up the good work. So I guess they will. Next. <laughs> 